Safari. It's difficult to realize that once upon a time, not very long ago, elephants, rhinos, lion, and many other animals, great and small, roamed where cities now stand in East Africa. It's hard to believe the stories told by early travelers and explorers of teeming thousands of wild game. The destruction of this game has been partly due to the advance of civilization increased population and settlement in areas where it would be impossible for wild animals to live side by side with man. It's an almost impossible task to teach people who have, since time began, looked on game as nyame yachukula, or meat for the pot, that they have around them a unique heritage which they must hold in trust and cherish for all mankind. There is indeed a growing sense of hopelessness about the future of these animals. There are others, too few, who are determined to preserve Africa's big game. To do this, some risk their lives every day as they go out into areas where animals are continually being slaughtered by poachers to capture and transfer them to safer pastures. It's our hope that in some small way, this record may help prevent this complete destruction and at the same time preserve some of the sounds of Africa which, although rare, can still be heard in remote parts of the country today. The recordings you're about to hear were made in such a remote place, far from the bustle of Nairobi, in the north of Kenya. There, a man named Freddy Seed made his own small game sanctuary and built a platform in one of the large fever trees growing around a waterhole where daily game of all kinds came in from the wild and dry surrounding country to drink. Realizing the precious material he had around him, he purchased a tape recorder and captured these sounds. After many months of patient work, he brought his tapes to us, and after many hours of tabulating and editing, we were able to use these sounds in the recordings you're about to hear. Now it only remains for you to sit back, close your eyes, and come with us on a safari for one night in Kenya. So if you're ready, we'll make a start. This place we're going to is inaccessible except by land rover. It's many miles from the main road over rough tracks which are hard to find even by day through thick clusters of acacia thorns, over open plains where cattle and zebra graze side by side, round outcrops of volcanic boulders, down the rough hill slope to the head of a small valley, down to the side of the water hole. The bush is thicker, the grass more abundant. Trees and bushes grow and flower all around, and bird life abounds. Back, back, back. The intrusion of men into nature's preserves always causes alarm to the animals and birds. The go-away bird, as it is called, repeats its warning. The guinea fowl chatter their disapproval. These are the helmeted guinea fowl. They have a sort of bony horn on the top of their heads. A game bird and very good eating, especially when young.
At the moment, the trackers are unloading the zebra carcass. The lion are occasionally fed to encourage them to stay nearby and not to interfere with the cattle. But if you look very carefully, you'll see the tracks of animals all around. They tell their own story, but it takes an expert to read them. Over there are the enormous footprints of an elephant, and crossing them, the spore of buffalo. They must have been there quite recently. Now there's the pug marks of a lion. As we put some bait down, they may well come back tonight. The trackers drive off, making as much noise as possible. This helps to give the impression that no one is left behind to endanger the peace and quiet of the glade. And now, let's sit at the water's edge and listen. There's the red-chested cuckoo, a piercing call that can be heard in most parts of East Africa. Indeed, in Nairobi, many a good night's sleep has been spoilt because of it. Over there, from the thorn trees on the far side of the pool, comes a call of the ring-necked duck. Sitting here by the water hole, you may be thinking, was our journey really necessary? True, there's water, bush and birds, but we haven't even heard a wild animal, let alone seen one. That's fair enough. In fact, there's a bird you haven't heard here before. It's a shrike, the sulphur-breasted bush shrike, to give it its full name. He's a pretty little chap, yellow and orange underneath, and grey merging into green on top. But there's not much hope of seeing him because they're shy birds. In fact, they normally only give themselves away with that piping little whistle. But getting back to animals again, there's so much to learn. Take those elephant tracks over there. On top of them, we found buffalo tracks. Well, that's very elementary, but it has told us something. It's told us that the elephant were here before the buffalo. How, you may ask, do I know it's buffalo? Perhaps it was, uh, say, Eland. That you will only learn by going on safari a lot and gradually teaching yourself and by asking others. Some Africans, particularly tribes like the Maasai, Turkana and Wanderobo, are nearly all born trackers. Now, once you've learned to distinguish the characters by their tracks, you start, as it were, to read a new language and to learn something about the habits of the wildlife around you. The best time of day for tracking is early morning when the dew is still lying on the grass so that anything passing through it makes a very obvious path. And when the sun is low in the sky, Always try and keep the tracks you're following between you and the sun. From here, you can hardly see those buffalo tracks, but if you move round a little, that's it, there, with the sun in line. You see how the light casts a shadow into the imprint? Hello, there's a babbler. Judging by his call, it's the Black Lord babbler. He's rather a dull bird, being mostly grey. But apart from the call you hear now, he's got another one which can only be described as being like the yowling of a cat. In fact, they're sometimes known as cat birds. Anyway, what was I saying? Oh, yes. There are various ways of telling how old tracks are. The ones we're looking at now are probably elephant yesterday, late evening, and the buffalo early this morning. Now, how to tell? Well, press your foot hard down here next to the elephant print. You see, yours are clean-edged and well-defined. But if you get down on your hands and knees and look closely, you'll see that already the slight breeze is blowing tiny pieces of soil and sand back into the print. 
Now, this way of telling how old tracks are certainly isn't foolproof. The tracks may be sheltered from the breeze, so it's always safer to cross-check. Now, come on, I'll, I'll show you another way. Over here in the grass, we'll use the Land Rover tracks as an example. We know that it passed through here less than half an hour ago. Now, look closely. You see how some stalks are bent over and flattened into the dry earth? Already, some have sprung up again. But as it's so recent, their imprints are still in the earth. In an hour's time, you won't be able to see those marks. Even if the ground is soggy and some grass is well and truly cemented into the tracks, there are still a few blades which will have lifted themselves up after being trodden on. But take one and fit it back into its own little mark. If it's a perfect fit, it's recent. If the mark has spread out a bit, it's old. Now hang on, I'd like you to hear this. It's the white-browed cuckoo, usually called the bottle bird. That lovely liquid bubbling sound is often heard in the evening and at times into the night. They don't fly about much as they're rather clumsy birds, although they must be reasonably strong flyers because it has been known for them to save their young from danger by carrying them away between their legs. Anyway, let's get back to tracking. Twigs and young saplings will tell you the same story as grass, plus a few more. As an animal brushes past a small bush, he may push a twig forward. And as he moves on, it springs back into place, making a scuff mark on the ground. Or the leaves may have been bruised or twisted. Maybe the twig broke. Then you must feel if the leaves on the broken off part are still fresh or brittle. Feel the break and see if the sap is still there or if it has dried. Keep a lookout for droppings. Feel them. You may find they're still warm. If they're not, then move them to one side and see if the grass has had time to die or become discoloured. Break them and see if there are any termites or beetles in them. If there are, you'll know that you're about a day or more late. Every time you go out, you'll learn something new. And through studying details, which at the time may seem unimportant, who knows but what an insignificant molehill or the way in which an ant bear has scattered fresh soil across the path when digging a new hole might give you the vital clue which you've been looking for to piece together some fascinating story on the ground. There's a bush buck barking. He's always very much on the alert, and we must be too. Even around this peaceful glade, there are animals who might resent you blundering about and possibly disturbing their quiet afternoon snooze. Even the most wary hunters have found to their cost how crafty some animals are and how the hunter can even become the hunted. There's a hyena howling down the valley. Come on, it's beginning to get dark. So I think we'd better get up into the treehouse. In a few minutes, the sun will go down. So we've climbed into the tree and now sit quietly waiting. The change from day to night is a most impressive experience. The twilight lasts for such a brief space of time. It seems as if the sun is falling from its place in the sky.
For a few minutes, the sky is suffused with a splendid orange afterglow. The trees and even the hard-baked earth seem to glow in the soft light as if they were radiating the warmth of the sun. It is a moment of hushed expectancy. Something seems to have disturbed the Egyptian geese. Perhaps it's an animal coming down to water. This particular pair of geese spend most of their time on the banks of the water hole, which they seem to regard as their home and jealously resent anything violating their rights. These beautiful birds can be extremely quarrelsome and even violent. that the geese heard that hyena before we did. They're on the prowl, away down the valley. It might be as much as a mile away. And this is the time of evening that the hyena sets out on his nocturnal wanderings. probably been sleeping in some hollow bank or rocky cleft down in the valley and soon his call will be answered by others. That's a jackal barking in the bushes somewhere nearby. Like the hyena, he spends his night on the prowl for food. Hello, what's that over there? Is it a lion? No, it couldn't be, not with that sloping back. No, of course it isn't. It's a hyena. And there's another one. As usual, they're being very wary. Perhaps they sense our presence. Otherwise, they would certainly be on the zebra bait, which is lying just below us. Well, then again, m maybe they know they're a lion nearby. You know... Few people are aware that these fearsome brutes are privileged animals. In common with other scavengers, they are protected by law for their value in cleaning up the dead and dying in the bush. These are the spotted hyena. They're the most grotesque-looking animals, being large and massive in front, while behind they seem to be weak and drag their shorter back legs. In actual fact, they are strong and have terrific endurance. Their chief asset 
is in their fantastically strong jaws. This, coupled with their phenomenal powers of digestion, enable them to live on the meagrest of diets when necessary, dry bones, old bits of leather, even the droppings of other animals, all are a meal for the hyena. noises, believe it or not, still the hyena. Many are the fables about this creature amongst the tribes of East Africa whose life, or rather I should say, whose death, is often closely tied up with the hyena's existence. There are still to this day tribes who dispose of their dead by putting them out in the bush for the hyenas to finish off. It's not entirely unknown for death to be anticipated in this way. There's the jackal again. Although a likeable looking little fellow, in appearance somewhat like a fox, he has some extremely unpleasant habits. For example, he'll follow a herd of Grant or Thompson's gazelle, waiting for the mothers to drop their young, when he will dart in and seize the baby before the mother has recovered sufficiently to retaliate. Hardly surprising that the geese are alarmed with all these scavengers around, especially as they have a few goslings with them. Lion, some way off. But he will almost certainly come up to the bait, and with any luck, bring his family with him. In other words, whose land is this? Mine, 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 mine. At any rate, that's how the natives interpret that call you hear now. The call of the lion, so often known as the king of beasts. It's a sad thing that except for places such as this, miles away from anywhere and as yet unspoiled by civilization, this call is never heard these days. There was a time when roars such as these were heard where cities and towns now stand, where he wandered free during the day. These days, his hunting is done by night, except where he knows he will be unmolested or unhunted.
Gamilek. You notice how he stops every so often to roar. And when he does, how he lowers his great black-maned head and arches his back slightly. How his whole chest seems to fill out. Take my binoculars and watch carefully. If you look two or three feet in front of him, every time he roars or grunts, you'll see a little puff of dust. You see it? That will give you some idea what force goes into that roar. Oh, isn't he magnificent? Look at him as he's turns and looks into the west and the last light makes his coat glow and all the muscles under his skin stand out and show his tremendous strength. Where a chap of his size would think nothing of dragging a dead zebra from the plains into some gully, a task which would need the strength of five or six strong men. It's funny, but when he roars like this, the hyenas seem to be completely awestruck, just as we are. But there's no doubt they'll start howling later on, especially as there's free meat for them to have under the treehouse here. That's if old Gamileg and his family leave anything for them. He must have had a scent of the zebra carcass which we brought with us, because he's coming straight for it. You notice how that roar of his has changed, now that he's... Let the world know that this is his domain. It's become a low grunt. That's the sound he uses to keep in touch with his companions. They're probably not far off in the bush. You may even hear them replying. You may think that these are the only noises the lion makes. But he also has a tender, purring rumble when he's satisfied and happy. And when he's angry, the rumbling becomes more severe and would be interrupted by muted roars. And if he's to attack, his tail will whip up almost at right angles to his back. He'll give a number of sharp coughs. Yes, I thought so. The hyena is still hanging around. But you see how wary Gamileg is, even though he knows this glade and has often been encouraged and fed here. Despite that slight limp of his, See how gracefully he moves around the edge of the clearing with those great effortless strides. Wait! There's a lioness answering him. I wonder how big the pride is. You see how he's listening to her? You see how he's listening to her? His senses are tremendously keen, and those great amber eyes of his will pick out his prey a great distance away. Or if he's in the thick bush, he'll hunt by using his nose alone. By the look of his belly, he's eaten quite recently. That's maybe one of the reasons why he hasn't made straight to the carcass. For there, he's lain down. He obviously isn't hungry, and is apparently going to let his family take their pick of the juiciest morsels. He occasionally grunts softly, perhaps guiding or encouraging the others. The frogs have started their singing in earnest now. Well, very lucky, because it's a clear night, with quite a fair amount of light. A few of the night birds are beginning to call. There's a nightjar whistling now. Nightjars are practically entirely nocturnal birds. 
then it's extremely difficult to associate the sound with a particular species of which there are many. This is a common problem with night birds. One can hear the sound but can't see the bird to make a positive identification. The odds are that this is the long-tailed nightjar. That's a Cavarondo crane and a robin chat. Rupal's robin chat, as they're called, are noisy little birds and often sing quite late into the night. just make out his shape in the shadows, only because we know where to look, otherwise he'd be very hard to find. The cranes are still flying around, probably alarmed by the lion or some other animal. Yes, that's a bush buck. It sounds like a leopard grunting. The bush bucks alarmed about something. It certainly could be a leopard. Maybe we'll hear it again. Now, it's hard to say. Maybe it was only the eagle owl. No, it must have been a leopard. He's frightened a baboon, and that seems to have woken up the guinea fowl. It certainly would be a bit of luck if we saw the leopard. But he'll be a very brave fellow if he comes anywhere near our tree while the lion is about. Those guinea fowl are a bit of a nuisance. They'll put all the small animals and back on the alert. Hello, what's Gammy Leg up to? He seems to be moving off. Now, what's disturbed him? It could possibly have something to do with the leopard we thought we heard earlier. He may be going to investigate. It has been known for lion to kill a leopard. Even the tremendously fast cheetah has to be very wary. More likely, he's going to join the lioness. That's her calling now. Certainly something's going on, but it's impossible to tell exactly what from up here. Tomorrow morning we'll have a look around and see what we can learn from their tracks. The hyena is 
probably thinking this is his opportunity to come in and feed on the kill. Despite all this movement on the ground, the birds never seem to be disturbed for very long. Like the red-chested cuckoo there, they live in a world of their own. It's probably lucky for us that we've joined them and can feel safe up in the tree here. seems to be coming from the fever trees on the other side of the water. That's an old dog baboon barking his alarm. They might well be frightened being the favorite food of the leopard. Yes, he's after one of them. If they're lucky, they may get away from him in the top of the trees. But the leopard is an excellent climber. What a pity we can't see what's going on. You know, this may sound like a one-sided battle, but it isn't always so. Baboons have a strong family instinct, and if one of them gets into danger, the others in the pack will rally round to help, sometimes even at the risk of their own lives. It has been known for them to turn the tables completely and kill the leopard. A mauling from a pack of infuriated baboons with their huge canine teeth and great strength of jaw is no light matter even for a leopard in his prime. It sounds as though he might have got one. Just listen to that furious snarling. If he has got one, he probably won't hang around for long, but will carry off his kill somewhere where he can deal with it in peace and quiet. The leopard has an advantage over most predators in that he can climb with ease and often takes his kill far up into the branches of a tree where it's safe from hyenas and lions. Sometimes when tracking in the bush, you'll find the skull of a dictic or a tommy wedged high in a tree. This is the remains of some leopard's larder. I think he must have gone off because the baboons seem to be moving away too. They'll often follow a leopard for miles, harassing him from the trees or even mobbing him on the ground. The leopard, rated as one of the big five and by some the most dangerous of African game, is an extraordinary beast. Stealthy and cunning. Much more like the conventional idea of the feline race than the lion. Yet the ferocity and fury he shows when killing is fantastic. He seems to go almost berserk, lashing out with his savage claws at everything in reach. In the midst of a pack of baboon or even amongst a herd of cattle, he'll often kill or maim in this way far more than he can eat or carry away. seems very quiet after the fuss and commotion. Only the frogs and a few birds carry on. The bush is like that. One minute a frenzy of activity, and then life settles back to normal. I hope all that noise hasn't made the other game decide to stay clear of the pool tonight. You know, I still can't work out why the lion moved away. But then there's no knowing what animals will do. Given the same set of circumstances, two lions may react in an entirely different way. You can never tell. What was that? Did you hear anything? No. Perhaps not. It's funny how you get keyed up in the darkness when in places such as this, 
and suddenly start this wishful thinking business. Before you know where you are, you're hearing some... No, there is something moving down there. And there's another one. It's buffalo. A whole herd of them. It's difficult to say how many at the moment, but there must be over 20, and despite their size, they're hardly making any noise at all as they move down to the water. That's the Egyptian goose angrily warning the buffalo away from his particular corner of the pool as they wade into the water. We might well be looking at a herd of cattle. And from up here, it's very hard to imagine these great docile-looking beasts as dangerous. Make no mistake about it. Mr. Buffalo is not the chap to take liberties with. A determined one can do 100 yards in about half the time you'd be able to. It's not uncommon for a hunter who's following up a herd to be caught completely off guard by some vicious old bull doubling back on his own tracks and waiting quietly for his greatest foe to pass by. In fact, you might well say he's a master in the art of ambush. If you manage to get up a tree, don't be surprised if you spend a few uncomfortable hours there with an indignant buffalo, murder in his heart, waiting below. Yes, they look just like cattle, don't they? Do you see the two calves over there? These big brothers of cattle, do you notice, haven't lowed once. All we hear are the contented snuffles with now and again the deep-throated grunt, and then a sort of sigh. If he's angry, the buffalo will bellow, almost roar. That must be their leader over there. Do you see, over on the left, the big fellow that hasn't come down to water yet, standing with his head held high, testing the wind. He's probably had a whiff of the lion, or maybe even the leopard. Whatever it is, he's being rather wary. No, he's decided it's safe. He's going down to drink, too. Look how he's enjoying that water, completely submerging his whole mouth and nostrils, almost up to his eyes, and shaking his head about in it. would call him a good trophy. The world record for buffalo is, I think I'm right in saying, about 58 or 58 and a half inches. In other words, not far off, five feet from the tip of the left horn to the tip of the right. This fellow down here is probably around about 48, which is a jolly good head. The way you tell it's a good head is by first looking at his ears and comparing them with the curve of his horns. If the curve is outside the ears, you can consider him a good trophy. That's probably old Gammy Leg again. He may be on his way back. If he is, we may see quite a bit of movement round here in a few minutes' time. You see the old buffalo is up on the bank again? And that grunt is probably a warning to the others to take heed. Yes, it must be Gammy Leg. He's on his way back here. There go the buffalo splashing through the shallows. It's not that they're afraid. Together, they could see any lion off, but where well betide the straggler in times like these. You see how they've grouped together on the bank down there. The leader, a few paces upwind, now and again pawing the earth and glaring aggressively in the direction that last roar came from. Almost as if he'd enjoy a fight. Oh, 
there's old Gammy Leg and the lioness is right behind him. They've probably decided it's much easier to come back and eat the meat we've provided for them at the bottom of the tree here than to hunt their own. I don't think he's seen the buffalo yet. Yes, he has. He stopped. He's looking at them. Oh, you hear that warning? Now he's turned away from them almost disdainfully. He's turned right round like a dog when he's making a bed on, in the grass. Now he's flopped down. The buffalo have now started to graze quietly. But all the time, they're moving up into the bush again. And the lioness is standing, looking at her mate, as if she's not sure what to do. No, no. She's not going to join him. She's moving away again. I think it's almost certain she's got cubs in the bush back there. Perhaps we're going to be very lucky and see the whole family. Old Gammy Leg is grunting gently as the lioness moves away from the water hole. It's more than likely that she'll come back with the cubs and possibly others of the pride. It seems that this particular lioness is in charge. Perhaps the cubs are her own, although sometimes a lioness will act as babysitter and even foster mother to another family. Something has upset the Egyptian geese. They haven't really got anything to fear from the lion. Anyway, all that noise going on earlier, and even the buffalo splashing about in the water didn't disturb them. No, it must be that the lioness walked rather too close to them. That lower note is the male bird. The female has a much harsher cry. If alarmed, the Egyptian geese will take to wing and circle around, protesting volubly. If they are young, one of the pair will fly around in this way while the other will try out the usual broken wing rules to try and draw attention away from the chicks, who, meanwhile, freeze wherever they may be. Jippies, as you can hear, are noisy birds. And nevertheless, their alarm is a typical and welcome sound in every part of East Africa where their food and water is available. Perhaps because of its fine appearance and striking ways, and because of its hardiness and adaptability, it has always been valued in captivity. The early Egyptians regarded it as sacred, and from that time forward, it has been kept in captivity in every stage of civilization. In modern-day collections of waterfowl, it has this one disadvantage, that it is vicious and quarrelsome to a degree and thoroughly intolerant of other species. At last, they seem to have settled down. There is the hyena wailing again. They know that while there is a pride of lion in the area, they're unlikely to get a look at the kill. Their turn doesn't come till the lion leave, possibly not till dawn. Despite his name, the spotted morning warbler is still alert. They often call late into the night, particularly during the breeding season. A 
And there, the call of that beautiful bird, the Cavarondo or crowned crane. He's not usually heard at night unless something makes him take flight. Their call is a deep, almost booming, melodious trumpeting, especially effective and moving when heard as they circle at last light around the swamps and reedy ground they favor before settling for the night. obviously furious at having arrived at the bait too late to get a bite before the lion. And if they could see into the glade here, I should think it would make them even more angry to see Gammyleg lying unconcernedly over there, now and again turning his head back over his shoulder as if he was waiting for his mate to reappear. As he looks fairly well fed, he'll probably let her come to the kill first. Some people think that this not uncommon habit of a lion is his good manners. There are others who say, probably rightly, that he only sends his wife into a situation such as this in case it is some sort of a trap. He seems to be looking more attentively at that game track over there now, as if he's heard something. Yes, yes, it's the lioness. She's back again. She stops a moment or two, looking at him as if to say, Are you still here? Now she's moving over to him. Oh, what a lovely sight. Look how affectionately she's rubbing her head against his great mane. I don't know how you feel, but whenever I see something like this, it gives me a sense I'm intruding on somebody's private life. And it's rather wonderful to find in this beautiful moonlit glade where everything a few hours ago seemed so straightforward in the daylight has now become watchful and secretive. And looking down from the tree here, it's almost unbelievable seeing these great savage beasts actually showing tremendous affection for one another. there's another, and another. They can't be more than a few months old, but they're already imitating their mother's weariness and doing their best, as you can hear, to roar like father. No, it's too much of a strain for one of them. See how he's trying to bite the other little fellow's tail. The lioness has moved to meet them and seems to be reprimanding the naughty one. She's given him a, a sharp shove with her nose. Now she's turned away. She's coming towards us. As she moves stealthily towards the dead zebra bait, the cubs are moving respectfully closer to father, all the time watching her with their inquisitive little faces. She's standing right below us over the kill. There must be some blood on the dead zebra's shoulder because she's begun to lick it. It's a habit that lions have before they begin to eat their kill. Her next move should be to rip its stomach open with one of her claws.
Yes, she has. Did you hear the air escaping from the stomach? And did you see how easily she did it? It's like a knife going through hot butter. Lions always start to eat their prey in this way. And after splitting the stomach, they neatly pull out the intestines and eat the liver, kidneys, heart and lights. You see how she's dragging the more unsavoury parts of the intestines a few yards to one side. I didn't notice that cub creeping up. He was asking for trouble and nearly got it trying to steal a quick bite to eat before permission was given. I don't think there's any general rule when cubs should eat, but obviously tonight Mother is in no mood to share a table with her offspring. Probably like her human counterpart, she hasn't had much peace all day and this is her first chance to hand them over to father and be alone for a few moments. Camilleg, on the other hand, looks very placid and has allowed the offending cub to walk right across his legs and under his chin. Camilleg, on the other hand, looks very placid and has allowed the offending cub to walk right across his legs and under his chin. Cub is still a little upset about the scolding he got from his mother a few moments ago. Gammy Leg doesn't seem to be a bit hungry tonight and is letting the lioness have a good meal. There are times when his attitude would be quite different. For when the leader of the pride is hungry, not even his favoured wife dare come near the kill, even though she may have made it herself and she will have to wait, as he is waiting now. It is, surprisingly enough, more normal for the lionesses and younger lions of the pride to make a kill. Usually the lion will skirt upwind of a herd of buck, zebra or antelope until they scent him and stampede in the opposite direction where the lionesses are waiting in ambush. It's quite fantastic how they seem to pick out the animal they're going to kill. Even the man-eaters in the olden days have been known to step over sleeping men round a fire to take the one of their choice, which rather goes to show that... Now, oh, what's Gammy Leg standing up for? Not quietly, but suddenly, sending the little cub which was nestling between his paws tumbling over. He's heard something which we haven't. And the lioness, too, has stopped eating. Now, what could it be? Even the buffalo didn't make them behave in this way. The three cubs seem to sense this tension, too, and are standing quite still with an occasional sideways glance at Gammy Leg. What the...? There's only one animal makes a noise like that. Elephant. They must be over there amongst those large trees in the thick bush. No wonder the lion stood up and paid attention, for here are the true kings of all beasts, moving as silently as ghosts through the bush. Not even a twig is heard under those great feet, and even in daylight, their enormous bodies seem to blend into the surrounding bush to make them terribly difficult to spot. 
what a wonderful sound that is. The whole valley seems to vibrate with it. A lot of people call that the elephant's belly rumble. But in actual fact, it's more of a contented sigh which is made through his trunk. This ability of the elephant to move silently is because of the bone structure of his enormous feet. To give you some idea what it's like, rest the tips of your fingers and thumb on something flat. Now imagine the hollow between that surface and the palm of your hand filled with fat and grizzle. You'll have some idea of what an elephant's foot is like. An enormous cushion. Gammy Leg's tail is twitching from side to side. He's not a bit happy about this situation, and despite her obvious hunger, the lioness has moved away from the kill. But let's not misinterpret their actions. It's probably the protection of the cubs Gammy Leg and his wife have in mind, as there's no animosity between these two great lords of Africa. Although in times of stress, Lions have been known to kill and devour baby elephant, and a fully grown cow elephant was once seen with scars round her throat, which had obviously been made in some brave but futile attempt on her life by a lion. Yes, the lioness is calling the cubs. I don't think they'll move far away. Probably over to those rocks behind us. Normally they would probably not move at all, but our tree house and the kill below it are very close to the water where in a few minutes time, maybe if we're lucky, the milling feet of a herd of elephant will be trampling. Gammy leg roars, almost as if in defiance of the elephant's trumpeting, as if he was saying once again, this lamb is mine. Gammy Leg, with one backward and rather reproachful look at the elephant, has moved over to join his family amongst those large rocks back there. I don't blame his discretion either. There are ten or eleven cows and four, no, five babies, one only a few weeks old by the look of him. Altogether, there are about twenty-three elephants coming down to the water here. The rest of the number made up of immature bulls, although that one over there on the left is quite a big fellow. The old bulls won't be far off in the bush. It's a habit with the mature bulls to live a detached life away from the main herd, only joining the others on occasions like this when they come down to water. They're rather like crusty old clubmen who believe in a woman's place is in the home with her children.
Although the bulls take little or no interest in their offspring, the cows show great devotion to their calves. Look, there's a good example. Do you see that one over there? She suddenly curled her trunk around the little one's neck and chest, as if to say, now then, now then, not so fast. You stay beside me like a good little boy. When a herd is on the move like this, the cows are normally in front, adapting the pace to suit the calves. But if we were to startle them, the bulls would be the ones to hook it first. But the cows will always stick by their calves, guiding them on the easiest path and helping them up slopes with a gentle shove. Even if a calf is orphaned, another cow will always adopt it. Although some of them are in the water, do you notice how, now and again, the ones still standing on the bank lift their trunks straight up? It's lucky for us the breeze is in our favour, otherwise they'd be off. They'll do this all the time, especially the cows, testing the air for the smell of danger. The elephant's nostrils are at the tip of his trunk. His sense of smell is acute and he'll determine at once what the right thing and what the wrong thing is to eat. That's a strange sound. I wonder if it's that baby elephant. I think it must be. It's hard to hear anything except the adults. Wait a minute, there is something strange going on. You see how those two old cows over there seem to be concentrating on the bank down to our right? And their ears, as sensitive as radar aerials, keep flapping gently. And that noise again. Now, I can hardly believe it, but I think it's the mating call of a rhinoceros. It's a very rare sound, but I don't think it can be anything else. Look, I don't want to make any noise, but I wonder if it'd be worth just moving over to that side of the treehouse and having a look. If one of these boards creaks, it may alarm this herd of elephant. That's the only trouble. Uh, it's all right. I've made it. The only trouble is that every bush down there looks like an animal. Wait a minute. I think... Yes, yes, it is. It's a rhino. Its head up, its ears twitching. It's probably a male and he's being chased around by an amorous female. That's one of the many strange things about rhino. It's the female who forces her attentions on the male. Yes, here she comes. And the old chap has swung round with a sort of sideways step. I'm not sure whether that was a playful or an angry toss of his head. Anyway, they're, they're standing looking at each other like a couple of overgrown pigs now. Do you see how much bigger the female's horns are? We call them horns, but they're really made up of a fibrous substance like hair. It's this so-called horn that has been the poor old rhino's downfall. Gone are the days when you could see 20 or more of them together in broad daylight. Now they're being poached to the point of extinction. Without the most strenuous efforts of preservation, these great prehistoric creatures won't have any hope of survival. These, of course, are the black rhinoceros, not the white, which are already very nearly extinct. I think these two are going to come down to the to water with the elephant. 
Yes, yes, the old chap has swung round and is trotting down to the pool. Although he may weigh up to three tons, he moves very lightly, doesn't he? Now, there's something that might interest you and also help your tracking, too. Do you see how much larger his front feet are? Now, many a person has concluded that he's found the tracks of a mother and her youngster when, in fact, they are only the prints of one. And the elephant don't seem, seem to be a bit worried about the new visitors. It's the rhino who are the unpredictable ones. Their normal routine is to spend the day five or even ten miles away from their normal watering place, using the same paths very much all the time, especially in thick bush. And if anything happens to be on the same path, the rhino is not the one who steps aside. Not very long ago, a rhino and a buffalo were found dead close together on a game track in dense forest country. That gives you a good idea what happens when two of the most stubborn and ferocious animals in the world have a difference of opinion. They are a bad-tempered couple. Standing at the water's edge, looking meanly across at the elephant with their small, short-sighted eyes. Uh oh look out. Now there's going to be fun and games. That calf had better watch out. He looks as though he's never seen a rhino before, and he's being a little too inquisitive. No, it's all right. Mother's seen it in time. The rhino don't like all this nonsense at all. They've trotted away from the pool and are standing as if they're having a serious conversation. And... Hello. The old chap's in a playful mood. Did you see that biff he gave his mate? Oh, and there they go. They've made up their minds not to stay and are off. In that typical way that rhinos have, like a couple of steam engines. appearance and disappearance of the rhino has, except for that warning scream from one of the cows to her calf when he became too inquisitive about Pharaoh, made little or no impression on the elephant. They've probably been meeting that pair of rhino and possibly their relations for many years now. I wonder how old that big cow over there is and what a wonderful story she could relate to us about Africa if she could only speak. No one quite knows to what age an elephant lives. And until recently, many experts have thought that some of these great beasts have reached the ripe old age of 200 years or more. I'm afraid... If you've been under that impression, I shall have to disillusion you. Because an elephant cannot possibly live more than three score years and ten. I'll tell you why in a minute. But just look over there at that cow jostling her fairly large calf out of the water. <laughs> I see. Look how she's throwing all that loose sand over him with her trunk. Now she's doing it to herself. Extraordinary thing, you might think, for a nice, clean, freshly washed person to do. But she has great method in her seeming madness, for despite that thick skin of hers, an elephant's blood cells are very close to the surface and are at times covered in sores. The 
this mother is probably doing what her relation... Oh, she's rather noisy. <laughs> but this mother is probably doing what her relations did a million years ago. Sealing off any cuts or sores which otherwise would attract unwanted flies. But I was telling you about the elephant's age. Why, you're probably asking, should such an enormous beast have only the same lifespan as a mere human being? It's rather an unfortunate story, really, because if the poacher or the hunter doesn't get him, it's more than likely that this will be the case these days, the elephant will die of starvation. And during his life, the elephant has a use of 24 remarkable molar teeth. They're enormous, often measuring a foot or more in length and weighing about nine pounds. But only one or parts of two on each side of his jaw are in use or, in fact, in existence at any one time. Now, while the first set of four teeth are being worn down, four new teeth are growing behind them, which gradually move forward and replace the old teeth which fall out. Now, each successive tooth is larger than the last one. And when six teeth have passed through each side of the jaw, no further teeth can be grown, and the last ones appear when he's about 60 years old. Now, this, of course, doesn't mean to say that there couldn't be a freak elephant who lives much longer because his teeth don't follow the normal pattern. But these little chaps down below us, if they're allowed to live, will eventually die simply of starvation. And let's face it, they have to have good teeth to consume between three and six hundred weight of food a day. There's one little chap right underneath the tree now. Do you hear him slopping his lips about over some succulent piece of tree? Do you remember I said there would probably be some big bull some way off from the main herd? Well, that trumpeting or screaming you heard just now, I think, came from one of them. They're probably coming down to water now. You know, I seem to be talking rather a lot, but there seems to be so much more to tell you about elephant than all the other animals put together. Whole volumes have been written by men who have made a life study of them. Yet comparatively little is known. Maybe it's because they cover such vast distances so that it's impossible to watch and note all their habits. Maybe it's because of their aloofness and independence as well as their individual personalities, which makes most people who come into contact with them love them. But now I can see three large bulls moving down the slope to join the rest of the herd. They're at the water's edge and... Oh, I could go on telling you anecdotes about them all night. But I don't want to bore you. You came here to listen to them.
three big gold bull elephants have been drinking at the water hole. In their own lugubrious way, they seem to have been thoroughly enjoying themselves. I don't know how much elephants do feel the heat. They sweat through the pores of their skin just the same as human beings do. They remain inactive during the heat of the day, seeking out some cool and quiet shade. Even so, a long drink and a shower must be most refreshing. Now they're turning away. The biggest of the three is the last to leave backing out of the water and half turning to heave his great bulk up the bank. They make no sound as they glide into the shadow of the trees. It never ceases to amaze how utterly silent elephants can be. Now they'll probably follow the main herd, but always keeping their distance. Aloof and pompous old gentlemen. For a while, all is quiet. With hardly a cloud in the sky, the moon pours down its soft light over the whole valley. It must be after midnight. Yes, it's nearly one. The great burst of activity of the early evening when the carnivores start to hunt is over. Anything that hasn't successfully killed is likely to go hungry now. Except, of course, the scavengers who know only too well that they must wait their turn and probably won't get a look in until the dawn. That sounds like the lioness coming back again. Yes, just where they came from before. She stands quite still, checking that all is safe. Maybe she jolted that bird off his perch as she brushed under a bush. I think it was a robin chat. Yes, the lioness is stepping out of the shadows and coming towards the carcass. Wait. The cubs are with her. It must be their turn to feed. This is all a game to them. They tumble over each other as they jostle close to mother's flank. Gammy Leg's mate with her three cubs is padding warily through the straw-like grass, her head held low. She's moving quite swiftly and the cubs are having difficulty in keeping up with her. Obviously, she wants to get back to the kill below the treehouse here as quickly as she can. Now she stopped. It was rather a sudden halt, and the cub in the rear rank tumbled into the little chap in front, who was turned, and very much like a boxer, has poked two or three left jabs at the little fellow's face. That bit of commotion made the lioness turn her head slightly, probably rumbling her disapproval at this unlion-like behavior but they're still too far off to hear the smaller sounds. <laughs> Hello, that's a hyena, and very close, too. Yes, there he is, scoundrel. Obviously about to rush in and take a quick bite to eat, but he's scented the lioness and decided against it. That bit of noise has obviously assured the lioness that the only immediate danger at the moment is that 
she must get back to the meat before she loses it to the scavengers. She's trotting very purposefully now towards us. She's trotting very purposefully now towards us. Yes, she's coming straight over to the kill. And this time it looks as though she's going to allow her youngsters to join her. Probably because the old man isn't there at the moment to act as babysitter. Can you hear her licking the carcass again? It seems to be a general habit, a sort of polite gesture before tucking in. The cubs are still too immature to know what to do and how to tackle such an enormous meal. And two of them are having a tug of war with one of the zebra's forefeet. The other one, I think it's the little chap who always seems to be getting into trouble, has sat down and is contemplating the whole scene. Now he's got up. Yes, it must be the little humorist. He's gone round the other side and is dabbing at the zebra's tail with his paw, just like a playful little kitten. The lioness is setting an example on how to dispose of a carcass in double quick time, lying there stretched out on her belly, tearing chunks of meat off with her powerful jaws taking the strain with her extended forepaws. Already her face is a gory mess. Now one of the leg-pulling cubs has given up the game and has moved alongside his mother, trying to imitate her. He's not making a great deal of impression. But yes, yes, he's got quite a lump of meat there. I wonder. Yes, I think the lioness has torn and loosened some of the more tender parts. It has been clever enough not to, as it were, spoon feed them. Just enough to give them confidence. <coughs> now the other two have seen the other cub's success and have moved in too. They squatted down beside their mother and look for all the world like little suckling pigs. All the time the lioness is on the alert. Do you see how she suddenly stops what she's doing now and again and listens intently? Perhaps she's wondering where Grammy Day is. It's rather strange that he hasn't come across with them. It may be that this is not all of his pride, and there's possibly another lioness in season somewhere nearby. Or maybe he's still lying on top of one of those big rocks over there, enjoying what little warmth is left in them from the heat of the day. <laughs> There! The lioness has lifted her head and is roaring softly, probably to him. Hello? The old man seems to be on the move. Yes, here he comes, hardly pausing to look around as he strolls over to the kill. The cubs haven't noticed him. They're so intent on their food, but they'll have to look sharp and get out of his way if they don't want a smart biff. Except for the trampled grass round the carcass at the bottom of the tree here and the 
fresh tracks around the water hill, tracks which will be old by tomorrow morning, waiting their turn to be obliterated tomorrow evening by new visitors. Nothing in the valley seems to have changed since we arrived. It probably looked like this a thousand years ago. Now, not only the lioness has a face covered in blood, but the cubs are equally gory and are eating as if they haven't fed for a week. It may well be that they haven't fed for almost that time, for a lioness has a hard time killing when her cubs are learning the law of the jungle. As yet, these three little ones are too young to join their parents in stalking. And their little legs handicap their mother in that she can't travel far afield when the game is scattered, as it is at some times of year when pools of water abound in clefts and gullies, where in the dry season there would be none. No matter what sort of litter, whether it be pigs, kittens, puppies, or lions, you always find it gets the dirty end of the stick, and this litter is no exception. Do you see how that little fellow has been pushed away to a portion of the carcass which is quite beyond his strength, and how, now and again, he does his best to push his way back between the other two to get his share of the tenderest morsels? long before Gammy Leg came back from that rock over there. Even when you pick him out, it's hard to believe that that dark blob in the grass could be anything else but a shadow, but as you see, the shadow is moving towards us and is, in fact, his magnificent black mane. seems to be a little excited at the master's approach. See how her tail is flicking nervously backwards and forwards and the rhythm of her eating seems to have speeded up as if she's sensed Gammy Lake has returned to assert his authority. Yes. He's standing on the edge of this small area of flattened grass great amber eyes fixed intently on his family. Now oh, he's moving across to them. The lioness obviously doesn't want him there. She knows his arrival means almost certain interruption to her feast. She must be very hungry to... Put her in her place. She did her best to bluff Gammy Leg into keeping his distance, but he came on in and seemed to swamp her with his power, which was incredible to see. Strong as she seems, she looks small in comparison to this great, dominant, black maned beast. And as for the cubs, they're nowhere to be seen. They must have gone to ground behind that Leleshwa. I said earlier on, he, he looked magnificent. Now, he looks as he, he stands just a few feet below us, the most superb creature in the world. No wonder he's called the king of animals. Nothing is <laughs> haunches. And with one wrench of his huge head has practically severed one of the zebra's hind legs. And look, there's one of the cubs creeping up to him. He's seen it. He's seen it. And... No. 
There's no sentiments in the lion family. Luckily, the cub moved out of the way and ran off in time before that great paw knocked him for six. It's not uncommon in such circumstances for a cub to pay with his life for such audacity. But this mood of gammy legs will not last long. He's shown now who is in command. That's as it should be. You see how already the lioness has moved back within a few feet of the carcass? And there are the three cubs cringing behind her. Yes, Gammy Lake has now severed that leg completely and seems to be taking no more interest in the carcass. As if at a signal, the rest of his family have moved in to finish their interrupted meal. There must be 15 or 20 hyena all around us in the bush. Some of them bravely coming within about 10 yards of Gamileg and his family, who are still feeding on the carcass below our tree. Now and again, the lioness lifts her gory head and looks menacingly around the clearing, obviously preparing to deal with any intruder. Although hyena have a reputation of being cowardly animals, it has been known for them to move in and, by sheer force of numbers, drive a lion away from a kill. But on these occasions, it's usually found the lion is an old one and too feeble to resist. Gamileg has completely devoured the meat from the zebra's hind leg, which he tore off earlier. But he still keeps one enormous paw over it, as if he's afraid someone might come in and snatch it away from him. All the time, grunting softly. And do you notice what a full-bellied grunt it is? as if the sound has a certain amount of difficulty in getting past all the food he's eaten. Now he's standing up. And he gives an enormous belch, letting the world know how satisfied he is with his meal. He's turned his head now and is looking at the lioness and the cubs who are still feeding, grunting quietly all the time, almost as if he's saying, well, I've finished. How much longer are you going to be? Now, now he's, he's looking around the clearing. <laughs> My word, he is having trouble with his stomach. Slowly, he walks away to the edge of the clearing and stops under a small thorn bush. I think he must be investigating, possibly making sure there are no hyena lurking close by. No, no. He's using the bush as a back scratcher, his great paws digging into the ground, his tail almost perpendicular at the same time rubbing his great tawny back against the thorns. Now the lioness is on her feet. 
She's nudging one of the cubs with her nose, but the little fellow greedily holds on to the piece of meat he has, firmly clenched in his teeth. <laughs> that nudge was a much more severe one. It rolled him right over on his back. The other cub has looked up to see what's going on, whilst the little fellow with a sense of humour pretends he's noticed nothing. The lioness has decided her family have eaten enough, and it's time they were moving. The little chap who had a fairly hard biff has stood up and moved away, complaining. Now the lioness has grabbed the joker by the scruff of the neck and pulled him gently but firmly away from the kennel. He's rolled over on his back as if feigning terror, his pale, fat little belly showing up plainly in the moonlight. The other cub has been watching all this activity and has decided it's not worth defying his mother and has joined the other two. The lioness has moved over to them and she's licking one of the messy little fellows who's really quite a revolting sight, covered as he is in the zebra's blood. Gamileg is moving away from the thorn bush. Yes, yes, he, he's going down to the water. Lioness and cubs are following him. As they drink, the sky shows the first tints of dawn, and Gamileg moves slowly and majestically away into the bush which leads into the rocky valley, followed obediently by his family. Now we see Hyena's turn to feed. <laughs> the lion have at last moved away and are now probably sauntering along in search of some quiet shelter where they can lie up for the day. They'll sleep well after their feed. The hyena cackle as though with glee at the prospect of a meal. They waste no time, but are already coming out of the bush. As they approach, they exercise only the minimum caution. Then there's nothing for them to fear now the lions have gone. There's one particular big old chap who's already reached the zebra carcass and is tearing away, gulping down the flesh in great lumps. You know, their, their digestion must be pretty good to deal with those mouthfuls. There must be ten or twelve of them on the kill, and still the odd one saunters up and joins the feast. <laughs> Hello, this should be interesting. There's a pack of wild dogs over there to the left. They must have come up very quietly. I don't think they bother with a carcass like this unless they've failed in a hunt. There are, I should say, about 15 of them. And they're standing quite quietly watching the proceedings. Their bodies are covered with patches and blotches of black, white, and all shades of brown and brindle. They instantly give the impression of great power and speed. Indeed, they are fast, for they live by running down their quarry. 
the large, upstanding round ears are a characteristic. The hunting dog is very remote from other members of the canine family and is in fact the only living member of its genus. The main point of difference being that it has only four toes on its front feet. Just listen to that fantastic whining and yelping of theirs. Their very presence in the vicinity is sufficient to scatter the antelope and buck for miles. It's because of this that the packs of hunting dogs are always on the move, following the herds of game, very much as the wolves in other parts of the world. The teamwork and cunning with which a pack hunts has to be seen to be believed. A victim is selected and the pack lopes along behind, gradually wearing the quarry down. Each individual takes his turn to spurt up alongside and jumping at the quarters or flank, tear out a mouthful of living flesh. Eventually, the victim falls and the pack closes in, tearing the carcass to pieces in an incredibly short time. They have the disgusting habit of following the herds of impala and rebuck at lambing time and seizing the young as they are dropped. However, they don't always come off best. At this very water hole, a pack once bayed up a waterbuck bull and drove him into the water where he stood up to his shoulders. The dogs tried to press home their attack, but were out of their element and were swept out of the way with great, powerful thrusts of his head and horns. They finally retreated. Yes, I doubted that they'd feed on the carcass. They prefer their meat fresh. With one accord, the pack has turned, calling softly to each other, as they lope away. <laughs> the hyena continue their meal undisturbed. Gradually, so that one hardly notices, the birds start up one by one, all blending together. This is the fabulous dawn horns, to be heard in the bush all over East Africa. A sound that seems to say, good morning, it's grand to be alive. Boo Boo Shrike adds his call to the chorus. He's called Boo Boo because, amongst a wide variety of sounds, they do make one which is exactly that, Boo Boo. They find their food, mainly insects, but also regrettably the young of other birds, by hopping about on the ground and scratching in the undergrowth. Because of this, they're not always easy to spot. Though so this doesn't really mean they're shy, but they are more often heard than seen. Here come the vultures. These are the hooded vultures, so called because of the ruff at the back of their necks, for all the world like a monk's coat. 
child. In the smallest of the six species of grouse are found in Kenya, and like the white-backed griffins, the lappet-faced or nubians and the white-headed vouchers build their nests or take over other large birds' nests in trees. As the vultures arrive, the morning warbler greets the new day. It seems strange that such a pleasant fellow as the morning warbler should keep company and sing in the same glade as the hooded vulture. Strangely enough, this character with the small head and mean, knowing eyes is completely protected by law in Kenya because they are what you might call the refuse wallows. And with the hyena and other scavengers, clean up the messes in the African bush. Despite his revolting menu, he is extremely clean in his habits, bathing as frequently as he can. If you're close enough to inspect his cowled feathers, you'd see how immaculately clean he is. Nevertheless, his reputation will always be linked with the high representatives of darkness and death. In areas such as this, where lion makes kills regularly, these unattractive birds will wait patiently in the treetops until they pick out with their keen eyes a number of their fellows circling around at a recent kill, or possibly around a maniata. But in areas where there are fewer lions or humans to provide some revolting meal, they will circle gracefully several thousands of feet above the earth, watching and waiting, sometimes going as long as a week or ten days without feeding, and probably covering in that time well over a thousand miles. It's been quite cold up here all night, and it's pleasant to feel the warmth of the sun in the dewy air. It's quite light and nearly time to climb down from our perch. But let's sit a while longer and listen to the birds while we stretch our legs and get rid of the cramps.